Um, yeah, so it all starts with your target audience. Who are they? What interests them? What problem do they have that you're solving for them? Um, and then what search terms are they using to look for a solution to that problem? And what language are they using? I, for example, work with a lot of lawyers who like to use lots of jargon and uh, Latin terms that most people, we glaze over and go, huh, what? Um, use the language that your audience is using. Um, I, I know that's a struggle for all of us when you're in your industry and you use this language all day, every day. It can. Welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew, and I'm your host, Brett Dicer. And this week we're going to be talking about content marketing because that is really important nowadays because if you don't have any content, no one really can find you, and then your boss gets mad at you, and then it's just a whole mess. We don't want to get you fired because it's hard to find a job as it is. So we're going to stick to that. And I have a content marketing expert, Allison, with me. And she is, as I said, a content marketing expert and SEO expert who has brought in revenue for many clients, creating strategic content for their websites. Well, welcome to the show, Allison. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. The first question I ask all my guests is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? Both, actually. I tend to do coffee in the mornings and tea in the afternoons, but I actually worked in a tea shop in high school, um, so I know way more about tea than anyone has a right to. I have a little experience because I actually was a barista, not for Starbucks, but a barista for a local coffee shop that's no longer around. So do you have any like specific teas do you like, like green tea, jasmine pearls, uh, oolong teas? Like, what, what do you prefer? Um, there's a Chinese green tea called Lung Ching Dragon's Well that is my absolute favorite. Nice. Never heard of that, but that sounds that sounds pretty good. It's a yeah, it's a nice light green tea. It's not it's not one of those teas that's gonna punch you in the face. I <laughs> got you. I gave a brief summary of your expertise. Can you give our listeners a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, um, so I always like to go back to how I got into this because it is kind of a, a long story, but it does cover all of the things that I do. So I, uh, back in college, majored in English and psychology, which turned out to be the perfect degree for what I'm doing. Had no clue this was an option. Thought I wanted to work in publishing. Graduated in 2009 right after the job market crashed. So there were no jobs to be had in publishing or really anywhere else. So I worked some odd jobs for a while, ended up uh, answering phones. It was fine. It was a job that mostly paid the bills. <laughs> Found myself between jobs at one point, and my roommate at the time, her dad, who was an attorney, was awesome and offered to give me stuff to do around his office until I got back on my feet. And one of the things he needed was someone to write blog posts for his law firm. Um, and he offered me the gig. He knew I had a strong writing background. And I was like, what? I can get paid to write? Seriously? Yeah, sign me up. So I jumped at that chance and started writing for him and then for an associate of his and then for some friends of mine, did eventually get another day job, which again was just answering phones. And I, it, it was a job, not a career. So I kept writing on the side. And it was one of those where anytime anyone asked what I did for a living, I'd be like, well, by day I answer phones, but I'm really a writer. And I would put much more emphasis on the writing I was doing than on the day job I didn't want to do anymore. So I uh, eventually grew it to a point where I could leave the day job and do this full time. Um, and then it was one of those where the more I did blogging and content marketing professionally, the more I realized you really can't do blogging without SEO and vice versa. You really need both of them so that they can work together to A, get you found online by the people who are looking for you and B, educate your clients and set you up as a thought leader so that when people are ready to reach out to you, they know why they're reaching out to you over the competition. So uh, that's me in a nutshell. Got you. So I mean, what is it with blogging? Because blogging has been around, it's the, one of the things I call it, it's the dinosaurs of content because the, when the internet first came on, blogging was really the only thing you could do. There was no video. There was no picture. There was barely any picture editing software. I mean, Adobe was around, but it wasn't primarily for digital stuff. It was still for print. So I mean, is, in 2024, is blogging still viable with the podcast, with short form video content, with video, with long form video content, with pictures? Is it still a viable option for businesses? 
100%. So first of all, uh, again, SEO, uh, which by the way, for those of you who don't know, is search engine optimization, otherwise known as making Google your friend. So like I said, when people are looking for you, you are the one who shows up. Um, Google is getting better at reading uh, images and audio content. It's still not great. It still relies on text to figure out what your website is all about. So yes, you need that text on your website to Again, tell Google who you are, what you do, what you're all about. Position yourself as a thought leader so that it will rank you when people are looking for answers to the questions that you are answering for them, looking for solutions to the problems that you solve for them. So yes, it is absolutely still viable, at least for SEO, if no other reason. Um, I do always, yes, video is huge. Yes, podcasts are huge. I'm not anti those things by any means. But I do think there's a way to uh, repurpose your content so you can use all of them. So you can make a video. Oh, excuse me. I had a sneeze that I'm trying to hold back. <laughs> so you can make a video, um, rip the audio from the video, post the video, post the just the audio by itself as a podcast, and then you can get a transcription of the audio and put that up as a blog post. So there is no reason for you to be like, oh, I'm doing video, so I'm not doing blog posts, or I'm doing podcasts, so I'm not doing these other things. You can do all of the things without spending all of your time creating content, and that way you can get in front of people who want to watch videos. You can get in front of people who would rather listen to a podcast on their way to work. You can get in front of people who are like me, who are readers, who would rather read the content. So yes. Um, and if someone finds your website and they're just exploring and trying to know more about you and what you're all about... A lot of people are going to go straight to that blog to make sure that you really know what you're talking about. Um, specifically, those of us in the B2B industry, on average, people are going to go through five to seven pieces of content before making a buying decision, and they're going to go straight to the blog for those pieces of content. So yes, absolutely still important. And is it important also to do blogging, let's say like LinkedIn, or should you just do it on your own website? Because you do have options. You have Medium, you have LinkedIn, you have your own website, obviously, but maybe you're not really getting a lot of traction from your website. Is it good to use those and then try to funnel them back into your website? Always try to funnel back to your website. So yes, I do recommend focusing on creating content that lives on your website, A, for those SEO reasons, because if you put it on Medium or LinkedIn, you are helping their SEO with your content that they're not bothering to create. Um, and then they own your content, so they can delete it for any reason. They, you can end up in LinkedIn jail for any reason or no reason. Um, you can end up being shoved down the algorithm and not understand why. So always, always focus on prioritizing putting content on your own website um, and then absolutely use those other channels to distribute your content and let people know, hey, I have a blog post. Hey, I have this content over here. And then use it to lead people back to your website. Got you. So with backlinks, backlinks, are they still necessary? Because blogging does give you that type of backlinks to it as well. That's, that's part of the process. So is it a good backlink way of creating blog posts? You can get backlinks, good backlinks. We don't, we don't want to promote bad backlinks, but good right. backlinks to your website. Is that another good way of like boosting your authority for your website? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, backlinks are huge for SEO. For those of you who don't know, a backlink is when someone on another website links back to your website. Um, that's an external backlink. You can also link to uh, within your blog post. You can link to another blog post that you wrote on your website. That's an internal backlink. Not as valuable. Still some value there. Um, but you really want to get, like he said, those high quality backlinks um, because Google assumes that like hangs out with like. <clears throat> so if someone is linking to your website, they're in a related industry, they're a high quality website with good content, Google already likes them. If they're linking to you, that will boost your SEO. If it's a low quality website with thin or spammy content and Google does not rank them for anything, that can actually hurt your rankings. So you do want to try to focus on getting those high quality backlinks. And first and foremost, you have to have linkable content, um, linkable assets, some people call them, right? What? It, why? Why should someone give you a backlink? What should they link to? What's in it for them? What's in it for their audience? So you have to start with that really high quality content that, again, answers people's questions, explains how you solve a problem for them so that they have a reason to link back to it. And then, yeah, there are various outreach strategies you can use to ask people, A, let them know you exist, and B, say, hey, would you mind 
providing a backlink to this article I just wrote. Appreciate it. Thanks. Got you. So how do you create that good blog post to have good backlinks? Because we can all talk about like, you need great backlinks, but the problem is, is that you got to create that content to make it to do the good mm-hmm. backlink. So how do you start that process? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of people are like, I like blogging per se. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it all starts with your target audience. Who are they? What interests them? What problem do they have that you're solving for them? Um, and then what search terms are they using to look for a solution to that problem? And what language are they using? I, for example, work with a lot of lawyers who like to use lots of jargon and uh, Latin terms that most people, we glaze over and go, huh, what? Um, Use the language that your audience is using. Um, I I know that's a struggle for all of us when you're in your industry and you use this language all day, every day. It can take a minute to go, oh, right, not everyone knows what that means. I should back up a bit. Um, So you can absolutely explain to them what it means. but don't don't rely too heavily on that jargon on those um, those those big words and just don't use big words in general. Anything over two or three syllables um, is it's just it's not too big. It's not that you can't use those words, um, but don't overuse them. Use them only when there really is no other alternative. Writing those short, clear sentences, um, short sentences, short paragraphs. Make it really easy for people to skim your content. Um, When there's lots of white space, they can read a lot of content without realizing they're reading a lot of content um, and they can get through it really quickly. Whereas if they just see a giant block of text, even someone like me, who's a big reader, even I'll look at that and be like, I don't know, do I really have time for all this? I have a million other things on my to-do list. I could just click away and get what I need somewhere else. But if you give it in short, snappy bites, um, super, super helpful and and readable. So, yeah, answer the questions they're uh, asking. Google prioritizes long form content. So like 1500 words ish uh, is the average, the average length of a post to show up on the first page of Google. So that doesn't mean every post needs to be 1500 words or longer. It means that's the average. They can absolutely be shorter. Uh, I do always recommend that it's an ultimate guide style post, meaning that you cover everything there is to cover in that topic. If that's only a thousand words, great, write a thousand words. Um, It should at least be 500 words for SEO purposes. Anything less than that in Google doesn't think it's worthwhile. Um, But it it does not have to be two, three thousand words long for every blog post. But do make sure that you are covering everything there is to cover on that topic, breaking it up with images and video. Infographics are awesome for this. Um, as well as using subheadings to break it up. So subheadings are also great for SEO. Um, They are also great for making your content skimmable because let's face it, not everyone's going to read 1,500 words, but if they know there's a section that they really want to get into, they will go straight to that section and they will read that in depth. So write content that allows people to do that easily because, again, if you just overwhelm them with a ton of content, they're more likely to just click away and get what they need somewhere else. Or alternatively, if you have a super short post that doesn't cover everything there is to cover on a topic and it's just a quick overview, you might get a lot of people who are like, yeah, I knew this already. What I really want is like a specific answer to this specific question. And again, if you don't provide it, they're going to go somewhere else. So give them that specific uh, answer to that question Um, and tell it in a story because, I mean, we can all talk about the facts and statistics all day long. Uh, most of us, that's going to go in one ear and out the other, and we're going to forget all about it. But if you tell us a good story, A, we're more likely to keep reading, and B, we're more likely to remember what we read. Um, and then that will make you memorable so that when they are ready to buy, they'll come back to you. So it seems like blogging is about layout plus writing because you have the layout, you have to lay it out being like, okay, this block of text here, this block of text here, and then put pictures, subheadings, videos, whatever you can. But let's say you're writing it and it does happen to be 500 words or less than 500 words. Should they just transfer that over to like a social post instead and be like, here's this because at least you're using it. I mean, it may not help Mm -hmm. your website at all, but at least you're using it. Maybe put it on a LinkedIn post instead. And there you go. Mm -hmm. People will read it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I do think that's a great, great use of it. Um, yeah, don't ever like write more just for the sake of writing more, just to reach, so reach some arbitrary word count. Like I said, I majored in English. 
I know how to do that. <laughs> I spent four years doing that, but I, I don't recommend doing that in your blog. Got you. And then let's say you do write something in it and they're like, well, duh, this is an overview. I already know. Could Would it be advisable to like redo the blog post and be like, okay, maybe I should add more to this and then start to, to add more to it. And then people, because blogging is long form content. So you could add to it and then still people will find it. So is that a good way of correcting yourself and like, oh, I did everything. And then someone's like, well, I really wanted to know this. You're like, oh, that's a good idea. And then going back and then just correcting that and then adding more. And you could say like, I've updated this. And so you're being ethical about it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I do always recommend researching your topic, um, either before you start writing or at least before you finish writing your blog post, just to make sure you are covering everything there is to cover on that topic. Um, but yeah, if something comes up later on down the road, um, I actually had this happen with my book that I wrote. So I, I wrote a book um, like uh, almost two years ago now and tried to make it as evergreen as I could. And six months after I published it, ChatGPT came out. And so I was like, well, now I have to talk about AI writing tools in, in my content marketing book. So yeah, I went back and, and published my second edition a few months ago. So that's always an option. Um, same with blogging. Yeah, you can go back and edit a post. You can add to a post. You can delete stuff if it's no longer relevant um, and then republish it. I do recommend republishing it if you're going to do that because that gets the most out of that post. Uh, that means you unpublish it, you take it down, you republish it with a new publication date. Google treats it like brand new content. So um, that new date actually really boosts your SEO. Um, and if you're, if it's a, a piece of content that is already getting traffic, even a while after you published it, by republishing it, you're giving it kind of new life and inviting even more traffic to it. So yes, repurposing content includes older blog posts, either because you have something new to say, or you want to delete some stuff from there and then republish it. Um, or if you just got super busy and didn't have time to write a blog post this week, you can uh, use an older blog post instead. Um, that is a, a great way to make the most of that content. And, and you reference AI, so I'm going to have to do the elephant <laughs> in the room because everybody's talking about AI. I use AI. So is it preferable to use it maybe to give ideas or maybe to even start to write the blog post? Maybe you're just complete writer's block. You're like, I don't know what I'm writing. I've been sitting at this computer screen or a piece of paper for two hours and I have, this is this and that's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, good to do, is it good to like help you foster those ideas? Cause we all get writer's block where we're like, I don't know what I'm writing. I don't know where to go. I'm completely lost. hundred percent. Yes. That is my favorite way of using um, chat GPT or any other AI writing tool is yeah, just idea generation, just to give you a starting point. Um, there's actually an AI writing tool I came across once that just writes like the first few lines for you. It's not going to write you a whole blog post, but it'll give you a few lines. And sometimes that's all you need just to get started, just so you have something on the screen to work with. Um, because yes, we all we all run into writer's block. We all have those moments where you're like, yeah, I kind of know what I need to talk about. I just don't know how to say it. Um, I, someone, I came across someone a while back who talked about it perfectly, I think, as far as AI is great for writing the boring parts, <laughs> again, just the facts and statistics. It's not great at stories. It's really bad at calls to action. So don't rely on it for those. Um, but you can have it like organize the information for you. And then you as the human, A, fact check it. It gives wrong information about half of the time. So fact check it first and foremost to make sure it's accurate but then add in that story element, make sure it's relevant, make sure it's in line with your brand and uh, uses your brand voice, uh, resonates with your target audience, has that story element, has a really good, powerful call to action. And it also could be just the AI you're using. So chat GPT may not be good for the stats, but perplexity may be actually better for the actual stat gathering because they all have their different quirks and they all do something better than the other ones, even though I think JetGPT4 is better at doing the writing. I'm not saying it's the best, but it's better at it than it was previously. But I found that, it, it, like, for us, we just need to figure out which one we want to use and then stick with it. So there's JetGPT, there's Gronk for X, there's Perplexity, there's 
Bard, which I think is going to be turning into Gemini or whatever. Google's going to be using it. There's Copilot on your Windows computer now if you're using Windows 11. So is it just like sticking to that one thing and then using it? Because I may use it for like scripts or help me write some like basic questions for podcasts. If I have nothing, if I don't know any other questions, I'll maybe use it for a backup because it's a general question that could help me launch it. So is it good for that stuff just in case you may need to foster conversations or foster writing for that? Is it good for that? Yeah, I don't know if you really want, um, if there's value in sticking to one tool over another, unless you're paying for them, in which case, yeah, you want to make sure you're paying for what you use um, and not paying for the same thing multiple times. Um, it might actually be more beneficial to stick to one if you're, like I have a bunch of clients that I need to make sure I'm writing in all of their different voices. So I have that unique perspective. Um, but if you're just creating content for your business and you want to make sure it's all in your brand, it can make sense to have one AI tool that you use and you train really well in your brand voice and how you, the, the kinds of content you want to use, the words you want to use, the words you want to avoid, um, cause the more you do that, the better it will get. Um, so if you're jumping around from tool to tool, you're kind of, you're going to lose that momentum. Whereas if you stick with one tool, it's going to learn your voice really well. Yeah. I mean, I heard chat GPT, you can actually train it to understand how you write. And so it may be better for writers to use that one because you can, I don't know if Bard can do that. I certainly don't think Gronk could because it reads your tweets. So if you tweet a lot, it could probably figure out how to write for you. So, yeah, I think – so basically either use ChatGPT but the paid version because the paid version allows you to, to do all that stuff. So would that be the best use of money if – if if let's say you're new to AI and you're like, I don't know which one to use and I just you know ChatGPT because it's been in the news everywhere. Yeah, well, definitely play around with the free version first. There is a free version that you can use. I know it's not as good as ChatGPT4, which you have to pay for, um, but at least then you have an idea of what you're getting into. Um, yeah, play around with the the free versions and see what works with for you. Um, and, and then when you get to the point of investing, then you know what to invest. And even a lot of the ones that you invest in will give you like um, a free, you know, seven day trial or whatever. Yeah, and so, I mean, we talked or you referenced like podcast to blogging. So is, is blogging becoming more ancillary to the other ones? Let's say you, you're doing a podcast and maybe you don't know that you could turn your podcast into a blog. So is it becoming more ancillary or are we still seeing just blogs just because it's a little bit more easy to set up a blog than a podcast? Podcasts are easy to set up, but they're still pretty hard to maintain as much as blog. Blogging is still a lot easier. Yeah, there's a lot more tools you need. I mean, you really can start blogging on your phone, really, and you really don't need anything more than that. Um, whereas if you're going to be investing in a high quality podcast, yeah, you need the good microphone, you need the audio editing software, you need all that stuff. So it's, yeah, it's it's more, I don't know if it's more work, it's certainly different work. Um, yeah, I, I think the the blog can be either or. I can certainly see a blog living, you know, on its own um, and just doing its thing to drive traffic to your website, but it can also be ancillary to your podcast. So um, again, you want to get the people who are listening and you want to get the people who want to read the content. And obviously we all want to get Google's attention. So the, the blog is great for that as well. Gotcha. And where, where do you see like blogging going in the next five years? Because I mean, we've seen, like the rise of email marketing, are, are, are you seeing more people going to be using email marketing for it because email marketing is another avenue to advertise your blogging? Are we going to see more integration within videos and videos convert into written material? Are we going to see like a VR blogging with the, with the Apple Vision Pro <laughs> released? Are we going to see more of that, more of the immersive blogging? I guess is, I'm just making it up, but are we going to yeah. see more of that in the future? Where is this all going for blogging? Because it's old, but it's still useful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I've seen, so I mentioned that law firm I started writing blog posts for back in like 2012, I think it was, um, where blogging was a very different thing. And really all I needed to do was research some cases that, you know, famous cases in the news that dealt with the same kind of law that my client dealt in 
and repurpose it for a blog post and slap a call to action at the end. And that was it. I was done. Super easy. It has gotten so much more competitive since then, um, which is how I started learning about SEO and keyword research and all these other things, because it got harder and harder to get traction with that simple, <laughs> easy blog post that I was writing. I really needed um, to up my game as an SEO strategist and as a thought leader and to position my clients as thought leaders in their industry. So I think that's going to continue, especially with ChatGPT and a lot of people using it who don't know how to use it effectively. They just want to create content. They want to put content up on their website for the sake of creating content without really thinking about how it works in their lead generation strategy. So we're going to get a, we are getting and are going to continue to get lots of crappy content out there. Um, so I think it's going to be more and more important to create content that resonates with people on a human level and sets you apart as a thought leader. So don't just say the same thing everyone else is saying. You, ideally, you shouldn't do that anyway. Um, but have your own thoughts and opinions on how this works, why this works, why this is important, why this is crap, why you should never, ever do this or why you should always do such and such. Um, and the the why is super important. Why do you think this? What are you seeing? What are your professional experiences here? Um, that's what's going to help you stand out from the crowd. Got you. Yeah, I mean, it seems like blogging is here to stay for at least for a while. I don't see it ever going away because for now, the written word is the written word. And even if people don't read as much, they still read blogs. So... Do you think, because podcasting and blogging is the most evergreen you can get, I think, on SEO for SEO purposes, do you think that we're going to have a more, I guess, marriage or mutual benefit between both of those more than video? Because video is a lot more work than both of them because as YouTubers and everything, you have to have higher and higher productions. Like no one likes low production stuff. So you're going to see a better marriage between those two of, blog, of podcasting and blogging? Possibly. Um, I do think there's always going to be the people who just podcast and the people who just blog. Um, and there's going to be the people who do both. And there's going to be people who blog and podcast about completely different things. Um, they're not always going to marry them. Um, I, like I said, I think you should, as long as you're on different platforms, make the most of it and get your, your message across all of the platforms. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of value in, like I said, in making those work together. And what are, like, how, if someone is trying to start a blog, like, how should they go about starting it? Because maybe, maybe someone's like, man, I really want to do this. This sounds like a great idea, but how do I start? I mean, that's always the, the hardest part is to always start. Hardest part. Yeah. Um, know your ideal client. Um, it always, always comes back to knowing your ideal client and the language they use, the problem you're solving for them, the questions they're asking around that problem, which again, for a blog, it's not always going to be, who can I hire? What can I buy to solve this problem? It might be, what is this problem? What is this industry? Who does such and such? What does this mean? What do I need to know about this? A lot of those how to, um, and, and what are blogs, um, are, are really good. Those, those topics are really good for blog posts. So focus on those, um, find out what questions people are asking, um, looking on social media, using your keyword research tool. Um, the easiest way is just to talk to people and see what they're, what questions they ask. If you are networking and having conversations with people and like, we're talking about AI, right? So of course I've written a bunch of content on AI cause it's something that comes up over and over and over again. So People are asking me this in person and on podcasts, they're probably asking it online too. So that is something that I invested in creating content there. So always, always make sure you are providing value. Um, have a schedule. So many business owners get started and they get excited and they write two or three blog posts and then they get busy and they forget about it and it's at the bottom of their to-do list and they never come back to it. Um, and when people see that, they might look at that, you know, that blog post that was last published three years ago and be like, is anyone even still behind this website anymore? So come up with a, a schedule, no less than once a month, preferably twice a month um, to write a good, long, in-depth, high quality blog post. Um, make sure it's a schedule that is realistic for you and something that you can stick with so that you are creating content on a consistent basis. Otherwise, it'll fall by the wayside and you'll never get back to it. 
kind of sounds like blogging. I mean, podcasting, because podcasting, people love it, start it, and then they never follow through with the schedule. And then it, it's, it's a, there's actually a term in podcasting called pod fade is where you start mm -hmm. it, but you go through three episodes and then you stop. So mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of similarities between podcasting and blogging because I feel like it's the two easiest to start, but the two hardest to maintain. Mm -hmm. And to really get traction with. Yeah. So that's the other thing about blogging is know that you're not going to get results after the first three blog posts. It's going to take a few months at least before you start really getting results from it. So, um, yeah. And then have a distribution strategy. Know that you're going to distribute it in your newsletter on social media um, so that you can drive traffic back to your website. Gotcha. So people are like going like, man, you've got a lot of knowledge on blogging. Where can I find you online to learn more about SEO and blogging? Yeah, well, my website is AV, as in my initials, Allison Verhalen. So that is avwritingservices.com. So you can go there. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn quite a bit as Allison Verhalen. So you can uh, connect with me there as well. All right. Thank you, Allison, for joining. Oh, any final thoughts, actually? I don't think so. I think we did a pretty good job of covering it. I don't want to overwhelm people. <laughs> I know I can talk about this all day. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Allison, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brand and sharing your knowledge on SEO and blogging. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining. As always, please subscribe to this podcast on all your favorite podcasting apps. Do a five-star review. It really does help. And join us next week as we talk to you a great fellow in the PR marketing industry. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding or starting your blog and understanding the SEO within your blog. And see you next week. Later.